Hello again, and welcome to Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood, and I'll be your host during this episode where we look at life in the universe. Astronomy Toronto is produced by the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And just an announcement to begin off tonight. Uh, on April 27th, there is what's called the International Astronomy Day, where amateur astronomical organizations like the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada put on a display of telescopes uh, for, to, to show public all about ast amateur astronomy. International Astronomy Day this year in 1985 is on April 27th, that's a Saturday, and we hope to have telescopes set up at the Ontario Science Centre during the afternoon to show uh, the public views of the sun, and then that evening, weather permitting, we'll have tel telescopes set up at the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill. So plan to join us Saturday, April 27th at the Ontario Science Centre and then at the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill. Well, the topic on this show is life in the universe and my guest is Tom Wojek, who is a producer at the McLaughlin Planetarium here in Toronto. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. Well, the topic is life in our universe and I guess the question is, Tom, is there life beyond Earth? <clears throat> well, most astronomers, I think, agree that there is maybe life in the universe. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But astronomy has now developed to the point where we can begin to uh, search for life. We know what questions to ask, we know how to search for life, and we know where to search for life. Well, certainly the Earth is a starting spot because we definitely know that there's life on Earth. Uh, what are the right conditions to support life as we know it? Well, you need a planet for one. A planet is essential for life, for um, the chemicals to mix, um, to form living matter. Uh, a planet needs, well, several conditions for, for, uh, for life to evolve. First condition is that it needs to have the right chemicals. Um, most of what living matter is made up of is, comes from the elements carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, and it turns out that most planets have uh, these, ma this, these elements within them. Second condition is there needs to be the right temperature. If the planet's too close to the sun, uh, it's too hot, life can't form, and life can't survive. <clears throat> if a planet is too far away from the sun, it's too cold, and uh, life can't survive as well. So a planet needs to be at the ideal temperate zone. And uh, a third condition is there needs to be liquid water, and, and that goes hand in hand with the, the right uh, with, with the right temperature. And that's liquid water being uh, to support life as we know it. And something what I guess we'll look at later is, you know, do you need water for life as we know it? What if there's life out there as we don't know it? There might be very strange forms of life, bizarre forms of life that we can only speculate on. Well, w taking Earth uh, as our starting point, uh, we have a few pictures where we will look at. Um, say start with our galaxy and give people at home an idea of where the Earth is in this whole cosmic perspective. Mm -hmm. So we can look at this first slide. This looks like uh, obviously a drawing of a, a galaxy. It's an illustration of our own Milky Way galaxy. And uh, our own sun is just one of 400,000 million suns which uh, lives in the suburbs of the galaxy. It's, it lives on the, or it occupies the inside edge of one of the spiral arms. Um, if we move in closer towards the, su the sun, we see that it, it uh, occupies an area of space which we call the solar system. Our own sun is um, the very heart of a family of planets, a family of asteroids, a group of comets as well. Moving closer in, there is of course the sun. The, the sun is not a planet, as some people think, but it is uh, a star. Uh, just uh, and for everyone at home, uh, a normal star, an average type star, uh, an everyday, run-of-the-mill, ordinary star, is what the sun is. Surrounding the sun are a group of planets, and the, the planets. I think that is most uh, interesting. The planet that is most interesting to us is the Earth, and we can see here on this on this photograph of the Earth. Actually, this was taken from an Apollo spacecraft. That there are three different states of water on the Earth. There's uh, solid water, polar ice caps, liquid water, the oceans, and of course the clouds, which is water in its gaseous state. And this makes the Earth unique. It's in the temperate zone. If we continue further, we can see that 
what's special about uh, the Earth is that it had the ideal conditions for life to form. Um, early on, early in the, in the uh, origins of the Earth, four and a half billion years ago, Earth's ocean was a chemical soup of, of uh, simple compounds, the elements which I mentioned, uh, amino acids. And uh, as the energy from the sun, ultraviolet radiation, energy from meteors, energy that we can see in the next slide, mix the soup together, they formed more complicated compounds, compounds which mix together to form longer molecules like beads on a chain, or like beads on a string. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way that's not fully understood by scientists, some of these chains develop the ability to reproduce and to make copies of themselves. And that's a, an essential characteristic of life. Life can make copies of itself. And I believe what you're talking about is the molecule that they refer to as DNA. That's right, the so DNA molecule. Something that, as you say, can reproduce <clears throat> itself, make copies. So it looks like there was a, a long string, a four and a half billion year string of events that was just right for Earth, and for life to be here. That's right. So the next logical question is, is there someplace else in the solar system, or any place we know, that has those same ideal conditions? Then that being a certain distance from the sun, mm -hmm. and uh, three types of water, mm -hmm. and these, these types of molecules. Too. That's right. All right. So let's tour the solar system and find out if there are, in fact, any other planets that have these ideal conditions. All right. I think in the first slide here, we have a picture of our closest neighbor, the closest neighbor to us, which is the moon. And we'll see that uh, here's a moon cut in half, I guess just two different views, Tom. <clears throat> That's right, the, the first quarter and the last quarter moon sandwiched together. At one time, when astronomers first uh, had telescopes, and when they looked at the moon, they thought that the dark areas they saw on the moon were seas. In fact, they called these seas mare. Mm -hmm. But the seas are not really made up of water. They're made up of, um, well, uh, lava, lava, lava that's bubbled up from deep with, within the core of the moon and smoothed over certain areas. It's now turned into a powdery gray soil. And the dozen or so astronauts that have landed on the moon and analyzed the moon found that, well, there's just the conditions are not right for life to form, uh, let alone survive. Uh, it's too hot on the moon and it's too cold. There's no atmosphere. Water would just boil away or sublimate into the atmosphere. This next photograph looks like the moon, but is not the moon. It is the planet Mercury. Mercury is, is similar to the moon, but double the size, a little more, in fact, the size of, of the moon. It, too, has no atmosphere. And the close-up illustrations and photographs of Mercury show that it's a barren, desolate world. Its surface is baked by the sun to well over 400 degrees Celsius, far too hot for water to be in a liquid state, and far too hot, f too hot for life to survive. It really takes an expert to, to tell the difference between the moon and Mercury. They, they look like very similar worlds. That's right. The, I think the real key is to look on the, on the slide, the bottom of the slide. If you can tell, <laughs> that, that's where it's, they're that close. They're very similar. The next planet in our tour is Venus. And Venus is about the same size of the Earth. And also about the same weight. It's often been called the Earth's twin. And for, for many years, astronomers really thought that beneath those clouds which blanket the planet, there might be living organisms, perhaps a, uh, an intelligent race of some sort, perhaps vast tropical rainforests. But it wasn't until spacecraft landed on the planet and surveyed the planet did we actually discover that there can be no life, at least life as we know it, on the surface of Mercury. The temperatures here are actually higher than they are back on, uh, on Mercury, well over 450 degrees Celsius. It's got a, a, a blistering climate this uh, radar map shows some of the, uh, the high areas, the, the mountains and the low areas on Venus. Its, uh, it, its atmosphere pressure cooks the surface, a pressure well over 90 times that of the Earth, and it's constantly raining hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. Not a very good place for life. Here's an excellent place for life. An ideal place for life, the Earth. And uh, it's, it's curious that from orbit, you cannot detect the presence of intelligent life. Only when you zoom in close uh, to the planet can you begin to see traces of a technologically advanced intelligent life. All right, this is obviously a picture from space of Lake Ontario. Um, in that last picture, we're really seeing uh, first 
points of how there can be life on a planet. This next planet is the planet Mars, where for a hundred years people have been thinking that there may be life. Mars, I think, is the planet that's inspired science fiction writers the most. Uh, <clears throat> some astronomers thought they saw canals, living forms of uh, an, an evidence of intelligent forms of life. Close-up photographs reveal no, none of these um, evidence of canals. But when we look closely, we see um, fine tendrils, little uh, waterways. But these waterways uh, pose quite a problem to astronomers because right now there is no liquid water on the surface of the planet. Where did the water come from and where has it gone now? It's quite a mystery to some astronomers. Here's another uh, picture that makes it look like there was water at one time on Mars. Flash floods. It indicates that at one time Mars was a, a, a warmer planet, a planet that perhaps could, could um, support life, a planet that might have simple forms of life that lurk uh, perhaps in the soil. The Viking landers, which uh, landed on the surface of the planet, took photographs. I think this is one of the most, these are among the most amazing photographs ever taken by anyone or anything, the surface of what another planet actually looks like. And those, uh, those trough marks are not, well, caused by a little creature burrowing into the soil, but caused by the, the space arm that's dug deep within the soil and uh, collected some of the soil, analyzed it for simple forms of life, microbes, bacteria, viruses, and it found none. Mars likely is a world that cannot support life. Incidentally, the, the seasons, Mars goes through seasons as, as the Earth does, and the snow that we see here is... Uh, snow made up of frozen carbon dioxide, dry ice, just a bit too cold for life to form. The next planet is the first of what we call the gas giants, and one of the next questions when Project Galileo reaches Jupiter in 1988 is will they find anything that resembles life in the high clouds of Jupiter? They'll actually be sending a, a, a spacecraft that'll dip into the atmosphere and analyze, chemically directly analyze the, the molecules. Jupiter is a gas giant planet. It has no solid surface. It's literally clouds layered on top of each other. And trying to land a spacecraft on the planet would be like trying to land on a cloud. You just fall through to deeper and deeper clouds. Some astronomers speculate that perhaps in these clouds, molecules could combine together to form simple creatures. Perhaps in the great red spot, there might be creatures that, that float within the atmosphere. But uh, most astronomers are rather skeptical of the idea just because of the, the high winds and the, uh, the convection currents, which would suck the material deep within the core of the planet and destroy the material. Well, this is my favorite planet, Saturn. But I think once the Voyager spacecraft went out there, they began to realize that it's getting much, much too cold for life, isn't it? That's right. The showpiece of the solar system lurks, well, no, towards the, the outskirts of the solar system. Saturn, it too, is a gas giant. It's... Uh, it's a, it's a world made up of, of gas and of clouds, but of its most defining feature are, are the, the rings which encircle the world. And these rings are probably chunks of ice and rock or, or rock covered with ice about the size of beach balls, and each of them are in, in orbit around the entire planet. It's as if there's billions of individual moons that encircle the entire world. Close-up views of Saturn reveal cloud formations, um, details within the, within the outer cloud tops. It turns out that it is just too cold. Um, and it's, if the conditions on Jupiter are not ideal for life, then the conditions on, on Saturn are even worse. The next planet in our tour is the planet Uranus. And we're getting out to something like 2 billion kilometers away now, aren't we, from the sun? A long way away. This photograph shows uh, Uranus and uh, five of its moons in various configurations. Artists, these are among the best photographs of, of the planet Uranus, but an artist might conceive the world as looking, well, something like this. Uranus is also a gas giant world and would also be subject to the same um, problems of, of forming life or of supporting life as the other gas giants. All right, the next planet out from Uranus is Neptune. And we're really reaching the outer edges of the, of the solar system now. Getting way out there. The photograph on the left might be a little misleading. It, it shows um, a ring around 
the planet Neptune. There is likely no ring around Neptune. This is just an artifact of the telescope. It shows, though, uh, one of the moons around the planet. And looking from the moon, we see that Neptune, too, is also a gas giant. The final planet in our tour is the planet Pluto. And are these discovery photographs? Yes, they are. Yeah. And if you look carefully, you might be able to find uh, Pluto. It's yeah. marked by the red dot. And among the best photographs of, of the planet that we do have, artists might conceive this, the world is looking like this. It's so far away from the sun that the sun is really nothing more than a bright star. Well, there are several moons in our solar system that are about the size of our own moon, uh, even about the size uh, of Mercury. And one of the strangest worlds is the moon called Io, uh, which circles Jupiter. Also called the moldy orange of the solar system. I think of it as a pizza, actually. It looks like a really bad pizza. Oh, terrible what, stuff. What about life on one of these moons? Well, Io is, is a planet that, or rather a, a moon that is too volatile. It's covered with volcanoes, and that's what gives it gives it its color. No chance for life on this world, which surrounds Jupiter. These are two lumpy worlds that uh, are encircling Mars. They look very much like what we think asteroids might appear. That's right. Chunks of rock. Some astronomers think that there are the raw ingredients inside of, of these uh, clumps of rock. There is evidence that meteors, and some meteors come from asteroids, um, in fact, have amino acids inside them. But are we talking about any atmospheres on these moons? No atmospheres. And in fact, the amino acids are not caused or created by biological processes. Instead, they're created by, um, well, non-biological non processes. Some of the asteroids which orbit between uh, Jupiter and Mars. And finally, a very strange moon, Europa, which also ro goes around uh, the planet Jupiter. Europa is an interesting world. It's quite possible that it's uh, it's a giant drop of liquid water in, in space, which is encased by a very thin shell of ice, thin 10 kilometers thick. And perhaps within these, uh, this deep ocean might lurk strange creatures, creatures that we might find five miles beneath the, uh, the, the ocean. So a lot of what you're saying is that in our solar system, there are a lot of mites and ifs but, and maybes, but who knows? But probably not. But probably not. What's the next step? We're just talking about our local solar neighborhood. What about other stars and planets around them? Well, it's important to realize there are a lot of stars in our galaxy, 400,000 million stars. And many of those stars are similar to our own sun. And many of those stars likely have planets moving around them. Now, astronomers haven't actually seen um, directly another planet, but there's, there's sev several bits of evidence which suggest and point to the fact that, well, yes, planets probably circle most other stars. All right, now there are a lot of huge telescopes on the Earth. Why can't I point it at a star and see a planet? Well, several reasons. One is a long way away. Yeah, four light years to the nearest star is, in, in terms of our everyday distances, is just vast, mm -hmm. a long way away. That's one to, um, basic problem. And the second problem is that stars are intrinsically um, much more bright than planets which encircle them. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you could resolve the planet, it would probably its light would be blocked, blocked out or overwhelmed by the brilliance of its yeah. of its sun. Like a match beside a, a headlight. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Well, have we seen any evidence of all of any planets around stars? There are um, there until recently just a few strands of evidence which suggest that uh, there are planets around stars. Uh, astronomers developed rather ingenious ways for searching for planets moving around other, around other stars. One of them is to look at a star and follow its motion for several years. And if you do that, and if you find that a star wobbles, you might infer that it's wobbling because it's being orbited by another, a large planet. Sort of like a, a tug as yeah, it goes along. Yeah, that's right. It gets whirled around. A few stars have shown this wobble, but the wobble might be caused by something else, mm -hmm. a dark star, another invisible star. Quite recently, astronomers have looked at at uh, stars using infrared light. An, infra an infrared telescope doesn't actually look at the light of the star, but at its heat. And any matter that surrounds the star gets warmed up by the star and re-radiates its energy into infrared um, radiation, which, can be, which is visible to infrared telescopes. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few months ago, a star called Beta Pictoris, a star that's visible in the southern hemisphere, shows um, what looks to be a disk 
uh, of matter around the star. It doesn't prove conclusively that there are there is matter, rather there is a planet surrounding the star, but it does confirm the solar system formation models. Okay, we have a, a slide of a, another star called Vega, and it is showing us an interesting graph here, Tom. If we can get that slide up, you can explain to me what we're seeing here. Well, this is a com computer-generated uh, slide or computer-generated image of a Vega and some surrounding stars. Uh, Vega is the big clump in the center, and surrounding it, you can see what um, some some um, lines which sort of look like a circle around the main clump. So these are potentially other planets. Well, this is matter that surrounds okay. uh, that star, and actually, it's evidence for both mm -hmm. sides of the coin. Perhaps they are what's left over of a of, of a solar system that's of planets that have formed very close to the star, mm -hmm. and this is the leftover stuff that's blown out into space, or perhaps the solar system uh, didn't actually form planets and only formed this dust ring. All right, well, when we talk about life on Earth, uh, just the fact that life started here isn't really the whole story. We had to evolve to a certain point to where we are now. Now, once we find life on another planet around another star, what do we know what the odds are about that the fact that life may evolve to be technologically advanced? We can estimate. We can give it a good shot. Um, in the late 50s, an astronomer called Frank, uh, whose name was Frank Drake, came up with uh, the Drake equation, which had seven basic factors, factors which would contribute to um, intelligent life. And, uh, and the factors are, are, are well, they're pretty simple. A in order for technologically advanced life to form, you need a star a star like the sun, not too hot, not too cold. Um, secondly, you need planets moving around them. Uh, you need an, an Earth-like planet. That's the third condition. You need uh, uh, life to form on those planets. You need that life to evolve into, to involve an intelligence. You need that intelligence to evolve a technology. And putting all those factors together, those are just six factors. If you put them all together and plug in different numbers into those equations, you, depending on the numbers that you plug in, come up with the fact that the universe might be teeming with life or it might be empty of life. And it just depends on what numbers you plug in. And those are just numbers out of, out of your head. Well, they're educated, well, they're, they're guesses. They're guesses. Yeah. That's all there are. And uh, if, well, if we say one, of, one out of ten planets uh, might support life and one, of, uh, one out of ten of those planets might have uh, life on it, one of ten of those, and so on, all the way down the line, we arrive at a figure of uh, 100 million intelligent, technologically advanced civilizations in the galaxy right now. Out of how many stars? Out of 400,000 million stars. Big numbers, but needless to say that the universe, rather the galaxy, might be teeming with life. But if you put other numbers in, you come up with a figure of one. One civilization, ours. All right, well, let's say we want to get in touch with one of these life forms. Uh, and we want to send a spacecraft out. Uh, how do you know where to? How do you know where to send it? You know, wh which star do you point it at? Well, that's the thing. It's it's uh, not a very good way of searching for life by to send spacecraft. Uh, the distances between stars are, are so vast that it takes an incredible amount of time to travel just to the nearest star. The vo the very fastest spacecraft that uh, humanity has ever created is one called the Voyager spacecraft. And right now, it's traveling at. 85 kilometers per second towards the planet Uranus. And if it happened to be pointed towards the nearest star to us, that one's called Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri, which it's not, but if it was, it would have to travel for 2,000 generations to get there, 40,000 years. And that's the very fastest thing that we've created. What about UFOs? If we can talk about them just for a second, people are saying, well, why are these guys talking about life in the universe when there are UFOs floating around? What do, what do the, uh, the astronomers think about those? Well, most astronomers are pretty skeptical of UFOs. They don't think that what people see in the sky and call UFOs are, in fact, the spaceships of alien cultures. Uh, any intelligent civilization would face the same problems in launching a spacecraft to the stars as we would. It's very expensive to send a spacecraft. Um, how would you know where to send? Uh, it would take an enormous amount of time and resources, so it, it seems very unlikely that the two UFOs that are reported in North America every day are, in fact, um, the real thing. That's right. Why don't they just 
drop down and give us a ride. Right? Well, I think it's, it's, it's important to realize that it's astronomers would like that UFOs, the, sure. they would be among the first. But it's, it's such an important question that it's important not to treat it well without skepticism. Well, any greeting cards that we send then are going to take 100,000 years to get there. What if we sent them a message with radio or even listened in for radio messages from another uh, society, a technologically advanced society? Well, that's where the search is, is taking place now, listening through to the faint uh, radio whispers which might be traveling and dispersing themselves through our galaxy. Uh, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico right now has the capability to send to and receive signals from another similar telescope across the entire galaxy, 100,000 light years across, which means right now we have the technology to, to talk to them if they're out there. But it's a matter of just knowing where to, where to listen to and where to send to. Yeah, and any radio telescope, astronomers want to use them to do other work. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, a project now set up called SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, that mm -hmm. the United States are undergoing. That's just started up, hasn't it? Well, it's been going on and on, on and off since yeah. 1960. It's been hard to get money. How do, it's hard to uh, convince some senators that they should spend some money to listen for something that may not be there. That's right. That's right. Actually, this week is, um, is an important uh, milestone in SETI. One of the big problems in, in sending and listening for signals in space is knowing what channel to choose from. In other words, you know, AM, FM, what, what channel. And there are as many channels to choose from as there are stars in the galaxy. That's a lot. And what's just recently been developed and been impl in implemented this week is um, a multi-channel analyzer, a, a, a computer that can li literally listen to six million channels at once. In the last few seconds, Tom, in just 30 seconds, what are the implications if we do tune in and hear somebody? How is that going to affect the world? Well, I think it would depend a lot on what kind of message we actually did hear. If we got a simple message, uh, one of binary codes, one of uh, maybe an ascending number series, we, um, it would just make a, a footnote in, in science, perhaps. But if, it, if they gave us information, uh, art, literature, in stuff that we would like to hear and we would like to send, um, maybe we would open a new chapter in humanity. A long-distance telephone call. The long-distance feeling. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, I'd like to thank Tom Wojcik, uh, producer at the Planetarium. Get out and see life in the universe at the McLaughlin Planetarium if you can. We'll see you at the Science Center on Saturday, April 27th for Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood. Bye for now.